tonight, we have Richard Pegg, who's the director and curator of uh, Asian art um, at the McLean Center up in Lake Forest, um, which is an Asian art museum and separate map library located uh, just to the north of us. Um, you'll note on the walls here are uh, facsimiles from the McLean collection that they have generously uh, provided to us. Um, he's the author of Cartographic Traditions and East Asian Maps from 2014 and the Chinese Blue Maps uh, Correlating Heaven and Earth in the Early 19th Century, which is forthcoming having to do with his extensive, uh, extensive work on these blue maps, uh, which has the unfortunate uh, requirement of having to travel the world to find, to find all the blue maps. Um, and he was a guest curator of Heaven and Earth, the Blue Maps of China, which uh, has, has been up in Boston uh, and it just came down, is that right? Um, and he'll be talking about that exhibition today. All right, so without further ado, please uh, welcome Richard. Thank you, sir. Um, and thank you to Chicago Map Society and the board members for the invite. Um, you know, for some of you, I introduced the topic uh, you know, as you know, every June we sort of host the group and uh, often we have our fellows uh, who typically uh, teach, so they come in sort of June, July, August, um, talk about the work that they're doing. Uh, but two years ago, our blue map had come back from conservation. It happened to be sitting there and I think uh, my fellows were all talking about other things. And I believe probably Curtis said something like, Hey, Richard, why don't you talk about the blue map? Because uh, we had it out. We'd literally gotten it back after it being away for three years. Uh, we'd had it out. We'd gotten it two days before. And so it was sort of sitting out. And he'd probably heard me talk about it earlier in the day or something related to that. So um, this project um, really began for me in 2007 when we acquired our copy of the terrestrial blue map, which I had acquired in New York during Asia Week. Uh, I'm an art historian by training, so Asia Week was something, uh, you know, most of you know me within the context of maps, but Mr. McLean also has the largest private collection of Asian art uh, in a freestanding private space uh, in the US. That's what I was hired to do. I osmosed somehow into as you all know, once you get sucked into the vortex of cartography, there seems no way to escape it. So I have embraced it like, like all of us. Um, so this uh, exhibition project emerged um, as part of um, working with the Leventhal. We've created a digital partnership. As many of you know, our map chats, our digital platform for publishing our collection. Uh, our MAP fellows are the primary authors for that. Um, I'm on the board of the Leventhal. And uh, so I'm also in charge of board of review. So I'm in charge of content. And uh, the Leventhal has one Chinese map. Uh, and so Garrett said to me, can we build an exhibition around our map? And I said, Sure, I can, I can massage that into something. And so th th this is essentially how this exhibition uh, came to life. I've been for the last four years working on a big uh, uh, publication related to this. Uh, would have been out this year. It was supposed to come out with the exhibition. Um, University of Chicago Press was a little slow in their review. You know how things work. Um, and then actually my co-author and I decided uh, in the end to rewrite the entire book. Um, it really had too much information. We had translated liter literally every text on every edition of the terrestrial and the celestial maps, embedded that into a narrative. And I think the common complaint was there's so much stuff. So we, we kind of extracted, we took out all of the translations and now uh, I think that the result will be worth it in the end. Um, but the exhibition was planned, scheduled, uh, et cetera. What you're looking at here are some of the installation photos. It just came down a couple of weeks ago. So you're looking, uh, the two on the left are sort of looking 
north. This is a very long, narrow exhibition space. Those, those of you who've been to it uh, know that. So you're looking north in the first one and south in the other one. Of course, I have to have a detail of what our map looks like. And then something that um, is sort of unique to the Leventhal, it's something that I really love, was uh, they reached out to high school art students in the community. And via Zoom, I gave them a series of talks talking about how they're made, the materials, production models, some of the content. And so eight of those young artists, teenage artists, responded to those things. And so what you're looking at here, if you can hear me, I'll speak loud enough. Careful. This has a light bulb inside of it. It's a constellation. It's a person sitting here looking out into space. There's two other portals in the option. Uh, he's in the color blue at the base. This was a uh, Mexican-American student. So he mapped his hometown and his family's hometown in Mexico. Completely made up series of constellations that the young artist has embedded their own. There's their his his house that he lives in, his family, his dog, and he's made them all into constellations. Really fantastic and creative. So that was part of the installation. So a really wonderful way to interact with the community. This is very much what the Leventhal is part of the Boston Public Library system, and so really a fantastic opportunity for everybody all around. So I was really excited to see when they started sending pictures of the final things, I was kind of blown away. And our map curator, Tom Hall said, can we buy all those things from them for our collection? Um, uh, the answer was no. <laughs> the kids wanted to keep them. They're not old enough yet to realize. So uh, this is my thank you for all of the people who participated in the exhibition. So the two uh, institutions, ours, the McLean Collection, my staff, uh, the people at the Leventhal, uh, as a thank you. Nobody's asked me about them yet, but Curtis will. I had blue map shoes made for all of the staff. And so every time I give a blue map lecture, uh, which has been in Japan, all over Europe, and all over the US. I wear these now. And I, I wish I had, like, we had a shop and I could make them available because virtually everybody wants a pair. Um, in any case, conservation people, installation people, again, I just want to kind of thank everyone in a public uh, setting for all of the hard work that they put into uh, making it look seamless and fantastic. So what's the exhibition about? Heaven and Earth. So this pair of maps um, were created in the early part of the 19th century. We'll get into that a little more detail. Um, but typically, um, they were printed uh, from about 1812 to about 1825. And there are only two collections in the world that own a copy of the terrestrial and the celestial. Both of these are in Chicago. The celestial, as you can see, is right here at the Adler Planetarium. And the terrestrial one that you're looking at is in our collection. And so this idea that we could join the two Chicago blue maps uh, and uh, put them together for an exhibition was too good an opportunity to pass up. So what's important to consider about these two things is typically all of the studies and work, and there aren't a lot of them, which is quite surprising to me, for these two work, works, polarize them, separate them. The terrestrial maps are considered cartographic and geographic and studied within a historical context, that historical context. The celestial map is scientific, it's celestial mechanics, it's all of those things. And so the original intentionality of the production has been completely separated. And part of what I want to do with this exhibition, and did do, is reunite them and get people to realize that these fantastic large format, that's each one of those is eight scrolls. The whole thing together is more than eight feet wide and almost four and a half feet tall. These are really impressive objects. These are big maps.
my my heckler. He comes with me. Um, unfortunately, you all know him too. Uh, why didn't I bring it with me? Because it's mounted as a folding screen, and I'd have to carry it back home. I got a ride down here. Paul gave me a ride, so, uh, but I'd have to carry it back with me. So um, sort of my expectation for an exhibition about Chinese maps in particular in Boston is that uh, the audience wouldn't necessarily have the ability to read Chinese text. These are all written in classical Chinese. So even if you read modern characters, which uh, everyone is taught post-1949, um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to sort of get what's going on. So with that assumption, I kind of focused on two different areas to consider for these. The very first one is the production model. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. These in map making history, I'm talking worldwide, there isn't anything ever made like it. It's a big, bold statement to make, but after I talk about it for about 10 minutes, I think you'll agree. So we start with the most obvious thing, and that's the color. So sort of during COVID, um, when this book project had just sort of begun, I began to write to institutions. Um, so there's a uh, uh, set as uh, in a, mounted in the Chinese way as Chinese scrolls uh, in the British Library. And I went to see that copy. And my assumption, so I'm a, a East Asian painting specialist by training, uh, was that these were made using indigo. Indigo has been used for print within print culture in China since at least maybe the sixth century. Um, and it's used ubiquitously in lots of contexts. China, Japan, Korea, it's also used for painting in uh, South Asia, India, Nepal, et cetera. And so my assumption, including for our own, was that those were used, that the colorant, the pigment was indigo. After I saw the copy that's in the British Library, I said, wow, Indigo can never reach this saturation, this bright, deep a blue. You can dip paper, color it with indigo multiple times, but it will get darker, but not brighter. And so my assumption was that maybe some of these copies use lapis, which would be at this scale immensely expensive to produce. So I began to write to institutions that have them and say, hey, can you do pigment analysis, uh, spectral analysis on these for me? And for the most part, I would say 98% of the 40 copies I've seen, no. Uh, the reason is most libraries don't have a conservation lab with spectral analysis. Some universities do. So ultimately, I wrote to Harvard. Um, as my little note tells you, so the head of uh, the Chinese section at the Harvard Yanjing Library is someone who had studied colorant in the Dunhuang cave chapels uh, in Western China that date essentially fourth through about the 10th century. Uh, so I knew he would get it if I said I'd like to do pigment analysis um, uh, to determine the colorant. He said, great but no one's allowed on campus. I can't get in. This was November, what did I say, 21? Um, fade to spring, I write to him again, and uh, Annie Shi Wong, uh, who's sort of his ass assistant, I think she's associate librarian, something like that. Um, she wrote to me and she said, well, you know, we actually have two copies. And I said, but you only have one online. She said, but why would we need a second one online? And I said, point, well taken, I, I hear you. And she said, would you like to go on a Zoom call and look at the two? And so we did. Um, and and uh, at that point, I reached out to Mr. Ma again, uh, Professor Ma, and I said, uh, hey, can we do some kind of spectral analysis? He said, sure, we have the Weissman Center. It's just a few blocks away. So this is, this is what happened that spring. Uh, it got walked over to the Weissman. 
And uh, the woman who was in charge there, we'll see her name uh, shortly, uh, she got them. I, uh, we were in, in correspondence. I think we had a Zoom call where I talked about the project and what I was trying to achieve and what I was looking for. And she said, uh, fine. Uh, apparently, an hour after she tested it, she had confirmed it was Prussian blue. And not only that, so she didn't tell me right away. Uh, the next morning, she went to several art shops to get different samples of Prussian blue to confirm that it's within the range of Prussian blue. She was so excited because the importance of this is that it's the first large scale use of Prussian blue in all of Asia. So 1812, Prussian blue had been introduced to Japan by the Dutch and to Canton by the British uh, in the 18th century. So the Dutch introduce it to Japan in 1750. By 1760, there are a couple of artists who use it in a very minor way. Uh, and then in the 1790s, the British start to export it or import it into Canton. So it's expensive and it's considered a medicine. So it's not in the usual kinds of categories. It was difficult to track down. Japanese attempted to recreate it in 1800, failed. It's a complex process. Uh, it's, a, it's a distillant. It requires nitric acid, hydrochloric acid. Uh, it gives you crystals. And depending on the size of the crystal, that's the tone of the color. So it can be from black to a palish aqua kind of color all the same colorant. So here are her results under spectral analysis, those uh, scientific geeks. This is the chemical composition for Prussian blue. So we have a colorant confirmed. Uh, it's at that point that I arranged for a place here in Elgin, Microtrace, who typically does forensic work for uh, uh, all of uh, police, FBI, all sorts of uh, government agencies. Uh, they also do interesting projects like ours. Uh, and so they confirmed ours was also Prussian blue. In addition, we have a black ink copy, and it's just straight up carbon-based uh, black ink, which was what I had suspected, and they confirmed that as well. So we've begun to get a few institutions to confirm it. Um, we also had the uh, micro trace do the copy that's in the Adler an immensely complex project because it's not in the building, as you know, part of that's under reconstruction, it's off-site, getting it from off-site up to Elgin, uh, a kind of logistical nightmare. There's some of the people I thank who are involved in making that happen. Uh, because it's under plexiglass, we have to take it apart, we have to, and they don't like to do that. Um, I told them that if it was in the exhibition when it got mounted uh, about 20 years ago, they actually didn't have someone who could read Chinese and the panels, the scrolls are out of order. So if you attempt to read it, it doesn't make any sense. I said, can we, and it, how about if I pay for it to be remounted? And they were like, okay, we're all good. So Prussian blue, unique. First of its kind in that part of the world. The other thing, it turns out that Deborah is one of the world's experts on paper, who knew? I had no idea going into this. The process for printing, so typically, whether it's a copper plate or a wood block, you carve or etch a negative image onto the plate or the block. You ink that. The space that's carved away is blank. A piece of paper is applied to that block. Pressure is applied and you pull off a positive from a negative block. This is really important because what I'm going to tell you is not that. Another assumption I had made, I knew it was wood block because we can see wood graining. Uh, large 
wood blocks, probably a pair, has to be something because they're four and a half feet tall and uh, 11 inches wide. But this is the Chinese, they've been printing for uh, 1600 years. So what she started to notice was people would stretch at some point. And then when it was absolutely freezing, it was mounted flat to a backing sheet of paper. And when you flatten it, those creases have to go somewhere. I think it's woodblock printed, and she's starting to tell me that it's not. And I'm like, I, I'm not sure that we're, we're sort of miscommunicating or I'm not understanding. You're talking about intaglio and verso. I thought I had a pretty good idea of what that was. And she's describing this process here, and I'm trying to describe the other process. Well, this is A different detail. What that tells us is that the process was what's called a rubbing. So the Chinese have uh, historically created monumental pieces of stone, steles, to record important historical documents from the Han Dynasty, about the second century BC, all the way up till today, still doing it today. Those who are interested in epigraphy and calligraphy and the collecting of calligraphy would often go and make a rubbing from a stone stele. So a stone stele is a positive image. The characters are positive. If there's a map, that's positive. And so the process to make a paper copy from a stone stele is you moisten the paper, you flatten it over, you use into the paper has folded. So as you know, Chinese in the early second century invent paper. And so there's lots of different kinds of paper. Typically for uh, a rubbing, you use a primarily bamboo based because bamboo fibers, high tensile strength, but a very short fiber. The typical paper that's used for paintings and calligraphy, sort of high end, has a very long fiber. In both cases, they retain their whiteness over time for thousands of years. But what you want, if you use the high quality paper to make a rubbing and you go to bend and stretch it, you will break it. And then you'll have tears in the paper. With short bamboo fibers, you can shape it. Not a lot. We're not talking about more than maybe three or four uh, millimeters, but enough. If you try to do the same thing with the fine paper, that ours are printed in a rubbing manner. That means the wood blocks are carved in the positive, and from that positive image, you make a positive print. So I mentioned to you my specialty, my training, my doctorate is in East Asian painting. I have never seen a rubbing style print this scale, let alone of a map of anything, anywhere in the history of Chinese. And I've talked to a lot of colleagues in the last 17 years, trust me. No one's ever seen anything on this scale. So those two considerations in and of themselves, the pigment, the colorant, and the method for printing. So this is one of the things that I wanted to focus on for the exhibition was the production model. There's lots of other details that are unique to this that are so strange. Uh, for example, I'm gonna just call. Each one of those is the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
collect eight scrolls to produce it. What you're supposed to do after you print them, you know, cut those off, mount it onto a scroll, and then on the outside of the scroll, you put the title slip. In a Euro-American context, we don't necessarily have this format. But if you have a lot of scrolls and you don't have titles on them, then you're opening each one to try and figure out what it is and which, which is scroll number one and which is scroll number seven, et cetera. Again, never have I seen this front end consideration. So typically the mounter, as is the case almost everywhere in the world, the mounter and the producer, the printer, the maker have nothing to do with each other. The guy makes it, then it goes to the mounter. Right? Can you imagine receiving, you know, you go to a frame shop and uh, tell the guy, I need this mounted. You know, you bring your Van Gogh drawing. And he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to just trim this edge off of it. Hope you don't mind. So this kind of consideration on the front end, which tells us something about the people who made it. These were people who collected rubbings, who were interested in this production model, who were interested in, so there's artists, there's scholars, there's, this is a complex group of people who have come together to put these together. This kind of consideration, and we know it's supposed to be trimmed off. And we have a copy right here in Chicago, at the Regenstein at the University of Chicago, which I only discovered two years ago, because all of a sudden it popped up online. And they said, no, oh, no, it's been on there for years. I said, no, it hasn't. We look once a month for Lumax. Um, what's funny about this copy is this strip. Whoever printed it forgot to put that piece of the block on the front end of scroll number one. So when it goes to Japan, they're immensely popular in Japan, exactly what I've described. The mounter doesn't even think about altering it in any way. I mean, that's not even a consideration, except for this. This is another unique aspect to this. And so he mounts it right where the guy printed it, right in the middle of the map. So you have this beautiful sort of king empire. And anyone with half a wit would have realized that, you know, that wasn't what it was supposed to look like. So, uh, the other thing is this little piece that they draw, it's called a dauber that they ink with, which is like a giant q tips cloth with uh, a cotton wadding inside of it. And so you have uh, ink in a container. And you kind of do this, and you kind of do this. That's one of the other interesting aspects. Because it's a rubbing, every single copy is unique because it's hand colored. And so sometimes some of the islands that you see out in the ocean, there's a very sharp out outline. Sometimes it's kind of like a halo. Sometimes it's left white. You know, So each time it's inked, you get something unique. So <clears throat> talk about the process. Terrestrial map that was created in the 1190s, carved into stone. It was considered so important that it was carved into stone in 1247. People have been making rubbings of it. This happens to be the one that's in Harvard. immediate process. Exactly what you're looking at is exactly what you get uh, produced on the paper. I've been dawdling. As I did. Um, so some of the themes I wanted to tease out were ones that I thought were fairly simple to convey. And one of them is what I call the Gu Jin paradigm. I've written about this uh, in several places. But this kind of term, kind of then and now, 
the conversations that happen over time to bring training considerations. Okay, and you want to know listen to that, and this kind of intentionality of recognizing the past and using that as a stepping stone to understand the present and changes that have happened, which gave me the opportunity to talk about the one map that the Leventhal owns. It's a good one. Uh, it's from the 1790s, produced in the courts in Beijing. Two maps reference the, the moment that the Jesuits first came uh, to China in the first decades, the late Ming period, the first decades of the 17th century. Both of those maps are specifically referencing that moment. The map below that is a contemporary map, a map created essentially uh, in 1767. Uh, this is the moment when the Qianlong Emperor sort of creates a space all the way and relationships all the way around the empire. Starts in the 17th century before the Qing is even formed. Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, Outer Mongolia, Eastern and Western Mongolia, Manchuria. They are Manchurian, the Qing dynasty. The last piece of this, we have Tibet, we have Vietnam, all of those borders is what's today called Xinjiang, which just means new border, is created in, the, in 1759. The Qianlong Emperor insists on creating a new empire map, and that's what you're looking at. So this is a juxtaposition. The point is, 1790s, what's significant about that is it's at that period that the Russians, the English, this is the McCartney missions we've heard about, that's 1792, uh, when essentially the British drive into Beijing and say, you're going to trade with, us, uh, and the Qianlong Emperor says, you don't have anything of interest to us, hit the road, essentially. But this moment of the, essentially what we call the West, I don't like that term because it's, it's, it's very Eurocentric in its consideration, but it's the moment that the Europeans are back. They came in strong force in the 17th century, then we had a kind of lull for a while. It's not that there weren't uh, Jesuits still working in the Chinese court. But once again, the end of the 18th century, a lot of pressure is being applied by all of the nations of Europe uh, and Russia from sort of two different directions, from all the way in, in the parts that are in Asia, which is, I think, like 70% of Russia or 80% of Russia is in Asia, uh, and then from Moscow itself. And so there's all of this pressure going on. But this map produced in the also created and reconsidered our place in the world, how we participate in that. This is the moment that this kind of terra aqueous uh, vision for this planet was introduced to China. These kinds of things have, been, have, have come before and we're recognizing that it's happening again. And this is a map that indicates those things. So the other Jin reference is When they were produced, they're both produced in 1247. They still exist today. They're in Suzhou in the Confucian Temple. They were, at the time, part of the education system. They were localized in a place of learning, uh, which is important to, as you look at the trajectory of celestial and terrestrial Chinese maps produced over time. about the two, the terrestrial and the celestial. That's the important thing for our Gujin consideration then and now. So the blue maps are very much using this paradigm as a model for their creation. A pair of maps intentionally created. These were originally created for the young prince uh, in the Southern Song court. This is in the 1190s. He's about to become the emperor. And the, the court officials create these two maps, and the map that they use is a map from 80 years earlier, 
when the Sung was an entire nation. The Southern Sung is because the Jurchen people take over North China. The capital moves to Hangzhou in Southern China. And so they create a map which says, this is something for you to aspire to. Let's return to the way it was when our family, our imperial family was at its greatest. In addition, there's correspondences that are created with what happens in heaven, happens in earth. That's another complex paradigm that, that the blue maps and these maps activate. So we have that same transnational in consideration about those correspondences between the two. It's about good government and um, a stable government. Uh, the other term I want to talk about, uh, the other paradigm, as I say, this, this kind of model is a term that I've coined specifically uh, at the time. So several years ago, um, some of my colleagues uh, in East Asian maps were um, wanted to reposition, we're all familiar with history of cartography, uh, the chapters on China, Japan, and Korea um, are at this point uh, 30, I think that came out in 92, uh, uh, book two, volume two, um, outdated. All of those scholars were trained in Euro-American methodologies of geography and cartography, and they attempt to sort of shoehorn those for East Asian maps. And so we had a conference to uh, begin to create uh, new typologies that are specifically East Asian, that don't prioritize a particularly European view uh, in terms of things like accuracy. So if something was inaccurate, it was considered inadequate within the context of 30 years ago, which is of course absurd. So one of the typologies that I have teased out and written about is administrative maps. This is not complicated as a concept, lots of places do administrative maps. But what the Chinese do is something that I've called encoded toponyms. And what that involves an administrative body, like a city, a capital, city, a prefecture, uh, all of the administrative bodies, top to bottom. But the inner part of the blue terrestrial map is every administrative body in the Qing Empire. It is not to scale because it's not considered important. This is an administrative map. But what it tells you is, communication system, tax base, uh, mail system, all of the considerations for essentially running an empire, population density, all of that information is up to you. And you see that all of these things of what these encoded toponyms look like. So, um, Within this uh, typology of administrative maps, we look to, and we include in the exhibition, so everything we've looked at is in the exhibition. First atlas that's created in 1555, sort of late-ish, mid-ish, mid-late uh, Ming Dynasty. There's an overall map of China, and then there's all 18 provinces. All of that administrative information is placed easily seen through this atlas format. Essentially, they take that key system and transfer it over time, it continues up until the early 19th century with our blue maps. Uh, then the last one I want to talk about 
Both of these production models are color, bright blue, and this. So there's something about the second decade of the 19th century in, uh, uh, in China where color and this particular map for completely new color. This map is only uh, like a third of the width. It's about the same height, but it's a third of the width. So if you can imagine, nation states that have relationships with the Beijing court. So you have Russia in one corner, you have Korea, you have Japan, you have Ryukyu, you have Vietnam, you have Thailand, all of these places that have direct exchange, cultural, uh, diplomatic, uh, monetary, uh, trade of goods exchange with the, with the capital. There's only seven things, and I've covered all seven that are in the exhibition. So those of you interested in more stuff about blue maps, this has been a crazy year, got seven articles came out. Um, there is, uh, the exhibition is closed, but it still will exist in perpetuity as a digital catalog. And if you punch in heaven and earth, uh, it should come up. Um, you can look at that and a lot of what I've talked today in, about in greater detail, uh, the big book, which will come out next year, if you're interested in, Prussian blue, I think that the blue maps, because they're so popular in Japan, the Japanese printmakers see them, realize there's locally China uh, produce Prussian blue. It's much cheaper than what the Dutch and the British are selling, and it's available in large scale. Revolutionized, it's called the Blue Revolution, starting in 1830. So that's Oslo um, is my co-author in the blue map book. Um, she and I wrote for that map and colors catalog, some of you have seen, which was that German uh, education production that they did. Uh, lots of uh, scholars contributed from around the world. We were one of the ones that contributed on East Asian maps, at the, specifically on the, on the production. We hadn't confirmed it was Prussian blue when we wrote that article. Thank you. <laughs>